Hey everybody, how's it going? Dan Schinder here on Drum Talk TV coming to you from Globe, Arizona. Where the F is that, you ask? I live here and I ask. <laughs> Actually, it's 100 miles east of Phoenix up in the mountains and we're here with our guest today, longtime offender, Rich Redmond's returning from Nashville. Chime in in the comments with questions for Rich and let us know where you're watching from Rich. How's it going, man? Thanks for joining us. I'm going to pull the show up here so I can watch yeah. comments. I'm not watching yeah, the it's, Flintstones. It's unbelievable to um, be, you know, back in business, man. It's this year's Mountain Face. And, yeah. you know, we we had this crazy zombie apocalypse that, that stole some time from people. And even before that, you know, we'd always see make a point to see each other at NAM. Yeah. But uh, great to see you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Eager to get caught up. A lot of things happening. So you're still doing Crash Course. You're still doing Drumming in the Modern World. Jason Aldean's 10th album just came out. You've been with him since you guys were rolling around in the back of a van. And then you're right. going on tour. Well, I'll, I'll throw it to you. Where do you want to start? What do you want to report on first? Yeah, there's so much. Uh, well, hope everybody is, is um, healthy and coming out of this, this whole crazy thing. I'm sure everybody learned something about themselves. Um, I was trying not to let the moss grow under my feet during that time because we didn't we didn't tour for about a year and a half. Uh, did some TV shows where I had to fly back and forth from LA to Nashville, which is very interesting. Um, but uh, then last year, uh, last fall, we did a three month tour, and it was so amazing. You know, when you when you don't see these people that you that finish your sentences and you 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 know you've been riding around a forty five foot tube for the last you know twenty three years together. Um, it, it kind of, def you miss it. You miss these people because you see them more than your blood relatives, you know, and it's just, it was, uh, mentally very anguishing. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was tough. It was tough. I almost like have like a little PTSD from that whole thing, but now we're back. We're strong. We're going to be touring this year. This first part of this year we did, um, like I said, you know, Jason had dropped his 10th record, which is a uh, very grateful. It's very humbling to the fact that people follow that music album yeah. after album tour after tour um which is a great thing to have in the music business to be steadily employed and it was a double record so it was 30 tracks it was kind of released the first 15 tracks and then another 15 tracks and we did all the cmds and the acms and the iHearts and the good morning americas and all that stuff and that is always so fun to do you know i never met a television show i didn't like and and then we're going to start going in the rehearsals and then we're going to do another live nation tour that's going to take us from june to october so we are jazz man that's good and by then you'll be sick of everybody again <laughs> just kidding <laughs> just kidding <laughs> cool yeah. um so what is different if anything about the 10th album from the last couple things people might be familiar with you know that yeah. that has been put out on record and gone on tour is there sure. anything different about the production about the music style you know, is the lineup exactly the same? What insight can you give us about the new album yeah, sure. compared to the history of Jason? Yeah, I mean, well, you're lucky, you know, when you have 10 records spread out over the first record was recorded in 2004. So that's 16, 17, 18 years, 17 of which we were, one of which we were inactive. So you take 17 years, you know, 10 into seven. It's like, what is every year and a half, every two years, you know, we're, you know, putting out a record. And so music, like everything, you know, grows, involves, it changes and, national of like anything it's like such a hot commodity right now it's like the new bachelorette capital of the world everybody's coming here from new york la atlanta you know everyone's moving to where you are or texas or florida or nashville and so we're getting this influx of all these creative types from the coasts and they're bringing their you know production methodologies and songwriting techniques to this songwriting capital of the world and finally at this point i i would say in the last couple of years you know jason's fortunate enough to be one of those artists where he has a sonic identity. I mean, you hear the guy's voice. It's kind of that, that raspy baritone. He's singing about love and loss and heartache and everything that happens in middle America. And that most, but most people can relate to yeah. set to big drums and crunchy guitars. And so he's got this, you know, sonic identity, but he's also one of the, I think few guys that can sing uh, like a throwback R and B song and a three chords in the truth, like old rhinestone country song, and then something more modern that's got loops in it stuff. And then more of a Southern rock, you know, detuned guitars, very few artists, I think that can cover that amount of ground and whose fan base will support that wide range of artistry. And then also his fan base being people, male and female, 15 to 55 which is nearly impossible to do yeah. so i think we're just at a point where we're, there's just this identity we're we're trying to grow and change but at the same time you know you give them 
give people what they want, that similar product that they can kind of expect. And But the melodies change and the stories change. Uh, but thank God everybody's just still supporting it. We're just, we're just very happy. And you must be having a great time playing to that variety of styles within that blended genre, right? I mean, you're not just sure. doing the same old thing all night. There's all those different twists and turns. That's got to be gratifying. Oh, it's so fun. And I just, you know, call all our friends at LP and like more and more and more in the last several years, you know, loops were very big and like mid early nineties, you know, Atlantis and all that stuff, kind of like that gurgling loop in the verse and then the big giant drums come in yeah. and then it went back, it went away and now it's back again. It's almost like, you know, corduroys and mustaches and hairstyles, they'll come around every 20 years. And so now loops are back. And so, you know, there's this whole thing where usually the first verse I'm sitting around and the loop is going to the front of house. So I have this whole variety of red, yellow, blue shakers, maraca combinations. I use giant rain sticks to shake things and just kind of bring the audience into my world because, you know, you're playing to 24,000 people and those people are way out there in the cheap seats by the porta potties and the, the, you know, frozen spiked ice. And, you know, you got to kind of reach them. And so a lot of times I'll have a cameraman right on me. I'll have a foot cam, I've got an overhead cam, and then I have a cam right over by my ride cymbal. So the guys in the back are like mixing this kind of live feed of almost like a live rock concert broadcast to all those people back there. So whatever I can do to visually, you know, giant rain sticks, I stand up, I, right. you know, I'm, I'm very, try to do that whole uh, Keith Moon thing without actually, you know, shooting myself with an elephant tranquilizer. <laughs> and <laughs> and so during the break, I've, even before the break, even before the break, I've spoken to some drummers who don't play at all when they're not working. I've yeah. talked to other drummers who do nothing but play. Play. <laughs> what was it like for you during the break? Were you constantly still working on your drumming? And I'm thinking you were doing something because you, you look like you lost weight too. You look very Oh, thanks, fit. man. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, you know, weight is so funny. It's like, it's, it, it's a direct result of the Getting choices over. you make. Oh. <laughs> It was just a, it's a result. It's a result of all the choices you make, whether it be with with exercise, um, diet, and you know your hydration, your supplements, all right. that kind of stuff. Putting it together over a over a long haul. So when people say, uh, you know, I you know I don't practice all week, but I practice six hours every Saturday. It's better to practice twenty minutes every single day because collectively there's this compound effect. And so I was always a runner. You know, in college I was like 145 pounds. I looked like Prince, and then I rediscovered it. And in, during the uh, lockdown, I ran six miles a day around West Hollywood, California, without fail, re-fell in love with it. I just pretended jo zombies were chasing me. And now, Which was after easy. those 700 <laughs> days, it's a, it's a new habit that I have to have. And it's great because you put yourself first. And when you put yourself first, you can give and give more to other people, yeah. your fellow men, all of humanity. So. So I appreciate you noticing that. So, so yeah, worked out really hard. Um, and it's easier to do now than ever. You get apps, you know, you can do like a little prison workout on the side of your bed, you know, squat thrusts and burpees. And 30 minutes later, you're just drenched and you're like, oh, I'm so glad I did that. Yeah. So I did that. I play, you know, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a band drummer. Like, I mean, I love drum solos like the rest of them. I, I worked so hard on that stuff in college, you know, at Texas Tech and University of North Texas. But let's face it, that's not how you get hired and keep jobs in the music business. It's about right. bringing the song to life. Honestly. So I want to be around people. But what I did during the break was um, I did a lot of online tracking um, for my buddy Blair Synthes studio in uh, Glendale, California. And also I have a place here, Crash Studio in Nashville. I'm in it right now. I'm looking at like eight drum sets, 20 snare drums, percussion instruments from the world, all mic'd up, ready to go. So I did a lot of that kind of stuff. And then I also designed some courses and taught at the Musicians Institute in Hollywood. My friend Stuart Jean asked me to do that. So that kept the sticks in my hands, kept me fresh, um, kept me interacting with fellow drummers. And so that was really fun. So sessions, routine maintenance, and yeah. then a lot of teaching. That's great. Uh, before we went live, Rich and I talked a bit about health because we were kind of catching up with each other. And many of you may know if you follow the show that almost three years ago now, I can't believe it's been three years, I was Nuts. diagnosed with a quite a high level of diabetes. Even though it was type 2, my A1C was 12.9 when I was diagnosed. And in six months, I got it down to 7.2. And it's kind of like that glass ceiling. Like, it's been really hard to get quite a bit if much below that so that's kind of been my thing but fitness is a huge part 
of battling diabetes. So I play as much as I can and we have a treadmill and an elliptical and weights and stuff. And that's a huge part of it. And during the lockdown, you know, a lot of people, like you said, learned a lot about themselves and some people didn't. And, And some people just really let themselves go and kind of some people made sourdough and then ate all of it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Because for a lot of people, it was emotionally challenging. And when we have anxiety, there's something that kicks in in our gut that makes us crave things that are bad for us, like sugar and starch and things like that. I learned this from my doctor. So this is why a lot of people who have depression and things like that, or they eat Uh, out of anxiety or pressure, depression, things like that. And it's easy. So these are the things that we we have to watch, even if you're not getting older like me. It's still a factor. And and like Rich said in the beginning, it comes down to the choices that we make, what you eat, what you don't eat, do you work out, how you hydrate, if you hydrate, the supplements you take. It's all part of a matrix that has to fit together just right. And if you're a musician, even if you're not a drummer – the most physical musician, well, other than the high hurdle tuba players, you, you still, you play and it's doing stuff for up here. Even if you don't move much doing this, it's still good for your head. And we need stuff to be good for our head when things are getting yeah. weird, right? Oh, totally. And, yeah. and Rich, you are really spinning back up. Now that things are open, you can get back out. You're getting back into a lot more of your, a lot more of your motivational speaking type gigs. Talk about that. Talk about the kind of gigs you want and how people can reach out and hire you for that. Oh man. Well, I appreciate it. Well, I've been cultivating my, my speaking career for well over a decade and I've done 12 speeches for folks like Cisco. And then, you know, your Microsoft's your Hewlett Packard's, you know, big whole hotel chains, big pharma, all the way to farmers and then high school graduations, college graduations. Um, It's just a a universal message that I've crafted and it's based on an easy to remember acronym. And some people love acronyms, some people hate them, but um, they help you remember things in mind. It's called CRASH. And it was also the basis of my Amazon bestseller. It's called Crash Course of Success, Five Ways to Supercharge Your Personal and Professional Life. And you could have it delivered as a dead tree to your house, or you can download it to your device, (laughs) or you could go on to Audible. And if you go to Audible and you subscribe to Audible, my offering is free and nice. these very these relaxing yet raspy pipes will read you the story um and it's fun and between each chapters it's like i do a little drum thing in and out of each chapter so i'm so happy i took the time to write the book but um the speaking thing commitment relationships attitude skill hunger five things that any people in any walk of life in any season of their life can use to be more attract uh, attractive uh, attract more success and prosperity into their life and that's i think what everybody wants Um, money gets a bad rap, you know, but prosperity is a good thing. You know, you're going to need food, shelter, clothing, entertainment, gas, you know, and money buys those things. So hopefully you find something that you're happy with that, that really excites you in life. So all of us that are fortunate enough to be playing drums, even on the weekend and making money from it, it's such a cool thing, you know? Um, but I've, uh, recent, uh, speeches were for like uh, 1500 vocational educators in Sacramento. That was very, very awesome. And then a security company called Sonatrol. And then I just went and spoke to uh, the uh, tourism bureau for Galveston, Texas. And the mayor was there and he introduced me, which was really fun. And then I did uh, the Georgia Manufacturing Association, which is a 122 year old organization. And um, that was so fun to think that an organization is 122 years old They've been through the birth of jazz, prohibition, uh, world wars, the Beatles coming to America, um, uh, AIDS, pandemics, everything. I mean, everything. And to be asked to speak at something like that, to be the featured keynote speaker, it makes me just think, you know, I'm doing something right and I'm just continuing to do those things. So, so, you know, chambers of commerce and schools and meeting planner uh, things and young presidents uh, associations. I do a lot of that. And then all the way to the, you know, the Fortune 500. And I don't discriminate. You know, I've got a gig coming up with the uh, American Potato Council. And, you know, I figure out a, who doesn't love a potato. Well, you can't have potatoes right now. <laughs> that's right. And I'm, that sucks. But I love Mr. Um, potato Head. So there you Yes. Go. And you know what I think I'm going to do is maybe I'll bring him and I'll have him <laughs> sit on my shoulder and I'll get all <laughs> sorts of fun. I'll break the ice that way. But, you know, uh, this is a thing where I'm combining things that I'm passionate about, which is, I love drumming. I love music. I love storytelling. I love motivating people, educating people. Um, 
I'm a show pony. I love to have that microphone in my hand. And it combines all of those things into an offering that makes me happy. And at the same time, allows other people to be affected in a positive way, which totally factors into my purpose in life, which is to affect people in a positive way and change lives. So to me, it just makes sense. And as much as we face ageism in the drum industry, you know, it's going to be hard for a 60 year old man to get a job with a 22 year old pop star starlet, you know, um, speaking, you could do to the day you drop. Absolutely. So that's, that's what's kind of, it's kind of exciting. Yeah. I'm a member of the national speakers association, the Arizona yeah. chapter, which is the founding chapter. I and, didn't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And there's two or three gentlemen that were there when Cabot Robert, who has passed on, formed the association. Two or three of the original members and maybe two or three other people that have been members since like the late 80s. And like you said, they're in their late 70s, early 80s, a couple of them, yeah. I think. Yeah. And they're still doing it and they're still rocking it. I just went to our chapter meeting last Saturday. And there's yeah. just so much wisdom in a room like that from everyone's different experiences, speaking on their different niche to their different types of audiences. And it's just such a wonderful community. Um, but it's, it's almost like an obligation when you have that gift to be able to motivate people, inspire people, you know, with a message and it, it never gets old, which is great. Yeah. And then being on the receiving end, we can never get too much of that. You know, I think there's something wrong with somebody who says, Oh, I don't believe in that positive thinking stuff, or I don't need inspiration. Like what language is what? that? You know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you might as well, you see what it does for other people. And you know, exactly. the, the Tony Robbins is the Zig Ziglar's and the Napoleon Hills of the world. It's all been, I wouldn't say scientifically studied, but as, as close as you can get using yeah. some sort of a science. Um, but yeah, it, and it's like, you know, and trying to figure out the, the best way to sell and market those different offerings. Like I have a different way of selling my keynote to corporate America. I have a di different way of selling it to school assemblies where the entire student body is there. And then sometimes people just want me to talk to the music and or arts program. So it's all, it's, it could be really the same umbrella of crash, you know, and that met that I idea uh, of that acronym, but also for the school kids, I might talking more about, you know, digital responsibility and um, teamwork and persistence and drive and integrity and character and reputation and all that kind of stuff that they kind of need to hear about. And like, what do you want to do with your life? kid you know i go around like what do you like oh oh i love sports so it's like well yeah well get in there man you need to be exercising working out right now working on your craft because your career is going to be over at 35 drop it give me 20 <laughs> drop it give me and the other kid's like i love video games i'm like well you can do voiceover for to give video games you could design the video game yeah. you could do the motion you could write the music for it and they go wow they see the possibilities of life and it doesn't have to be necessarily following in the footsteps of what their their parents did you know they can right. follow their dreams you know? Exactly. Absolutely. Let's take some questions. Look at some. Uh... And you're like, there's no questions. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> What's really funny is, is that, you know, the things that I teach is like what I do is not rocket science. It's just about finding the big beat, bringing that song to life with a smile on your, your face and, you know, showing up and exceeding expectations. Yeah. And any that's why my message is you can do it, too. You just have to have that thick skin to survive the business of music, which is yeah. not for the faint of heart. You know, Ab that's absolutely. really. That's, you know. um, where did I see the question? Jim Ho. Hey, Jim. Jim's asking, does Rich know country drummer Bryce Williams? Bryce Williams. Yes, he was uh, played with Lady Antebellum in yeah. the very, very early days. And they went through about four or five drummers at this point. But he was on the early end of it. Matter of fact, I think he was playing and... We opened up for them or they opened up for us, but we were both there. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I forget that the questions are now showing up for me on a little monitor down here. So nice. let's see. Um, oh, cool. Watching from the coast of Oregon, Michael Bovomatic. Uh, Wayne nice. Sim says, hi, Dan and Rich. Uh, Jim needs to talk to me about the diabetes. Awesome. Oh, nice. um, cool. And Rob Robinson says, hey there, guys and gals, sticks up that's right as long as they're not up your because that's how everyone seems when they criticize other drummers like their sticks are up there well <laughs> finish that sentence speaking about sticks up talk about drumming in the modern world 
Oh, yeah. So Drumming in the Modern World, I can't believe it. It's a product that I've had out for, I cannot believe this, since uh, 2015. And I created it. And um, my producer and director was the guy, Eric Doris, killer drummer, killer cinematographer, director that did all the Todd Superman DVDs, the methods and mechanics stuff. So um, it's a five and a half hour training program with 120 HD videos. And you just go to drumminginthemodernworld.com. And you stream this product for 99 bucks for your entire life. And it's just wow. a lot of things that I know about drumming, which is how to set up a cue mix and how to create a cheat chart and how to read the Nashville number system and little tidbits on, on how to make a backline drum set sound good and um, deconstruction of all the early Jason Aldean hits. And then plus another 15 songs from different artists and different genres. And there's 40 something drums, mini drum solos. So it's a, kind of hitting on everything, the basics of hand development, kind of like, this is my take on everything I know about drumming. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it, it just that's, you guys can have it. It's, it's out there. And I just felt like by the time I, I hit 45 years old, my friend um, Vic Salazar, you know, who used to own, yeah. you know, Vic's drum solo, was just kind of like a muse and a mayor of the drum industry, which is such a wonderful guy, so knowledgeable. A dear friend of mine, he said, man, it's time. You know, he goes, DVDs have died, but you got to put out something that creates a legacy for yourself, you know. Um, and I was like, that's a great idea. So you do all the hard work that's associated with doing something like that. And, um, you know, just meeting Eric Doris was a, just a great gift in life because he had such a vision. And I, th I think Eric's last goal is he wants to perhaps maybe do some sort of a product with, with Vinny. So I hope it happens. Mm, interesting. That would be great. Yeah. Interesting. That would be cool. Maybe. Maybe. So, That'd be so fun. on the topic of everything that you cover in that program, what do you think are one or two of the most common things that most drummers miss or don't pay attention and or give enough credit to get better at, leave out of their development? You know where I'm going. What, what sure. do you think are one or two of the biggest things that get neglected? The number one skill that I think has helped my career and has like, I look at the careers of people that I admire is the ability to, to read music and to read music really well. Whether someone puts it in front of you and says, here you go, kid. And sight you read. don't have any chin, you sight read it. So, so we're talking like, uh, we're talking big bands. We're talking film score dates. We're talking cruise ships. Um, we're talking anytime someone has the bass drum pattern, the snare drum, the exact fills, where the hi-hat is open, where the crash cymbals are, all that stuff um, is really, really important. And the ability for you to listen to a song and perhaps create a chart for yourself. And it could be a through composed note for note, every hi-hat opening, or it could be what I call a phrase chart, which is outlining the phrases of the piece and in, uh, including important fills, dynamics, color choices like cross stick, snare drum, ride cymbal, bell of the ride. Um, and I, I'm literally looking at filing cabinets in my room that are filled with every chart that I've ever read or created from my whatever playing drums since 1976, I held on to everything. And at some point I would, I would digitize these things. It sounds like a massive project, but the ability to read music is paramount because even if you go to learn the Nashville number system, which is based on like just outlining the harmonic structure of a song. So one, four, five, you know, in the key of C major, C, F major, five, and then G major. And, uh, just to be able to read those every day in the studio, a lot of times people have demoitis or they want something very specific from the program demo or some, from the drummer that played on the demo. And now I'm going to play on the, the record version of the song and they, people get very attached to things. So you have to be able to write out like figures and drumistic information. I'll write it on top of the number chart. But the very first thing to do is to be able to read, say, like page 38 from the Ted Reed book. Da, 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 da. Sing it. Count it. You know, like one and and three, four, one, two, and yeah. and one, two, three, and and one and and three, one and and three, and and one, two, and and four, and and three, four, and and three, and so and so I if I tell kids like look at that's the first step, you gotta be able to read that down, no problem, know the sticking, know the counting, be able to scat it. Yeah. And then that that way when you are working in an industry where people are ex expecting you to do things quickly, time is money, they're expecting you to eat it, exceed expectations expectations the reading the music is going to come in so so handy you know and you how do you sub yeah. for a gig without being able to either read their charts or like you said make your own phrase charts 
Oh my God. And sometimes it's just one hour before the show. You know, yeah. I get like a, you get a it. knock on the dressing room door. That's hey right. man, the drummer in the opening act uh, broke his foot. And you're like, what? And then you got to go out and you got to learn five songs really quickly. His drums are set up. You're ready to go, man. Just like, you know, get the phrases and get the BPMs. And then I meet really quickly with the people backstage. Like I got the live version. How does it end? Oh, okay. Bah, 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 bah. Oh, and then hang on that and do a trash can. And so you write it out, you know, and so, and you have the ability to save the day uh, for right. someone. And also by reading music, you, now the world is your oyster. You could, you could get the new Gadamitz book and you could yeah. steal everything from Gad. You can go back into Todd's method and mechanics and it's all written out. Matter of fact, if uh, my gift to the drumming world is you can go to richredmond.com, R-E-D-M-O-N-D. You can go to the shop icon, click on the shop icon and I have like 10 PDF um, booklets of every Jason Aldean song I've ever recorded completely transcribed. Oh, that's no, awesome. No. And it's just my gift to you. You guys take it. You work on it. It allows you to accomplish several things. You're working on your reading and you're working on your stylistic interpretation of a specific genre that's doing very well right now. I mean, what genres are really working right now? Yeah. Hip hop and country. They're still putting butts in seats. So those are probably two languages that you've got to learn to speak. That's great. You used one of my favorite musical terms, which is scat. Yeah. Um, first of all, I love the genre. And the funny thing about how you used it while we're talking about writing and reading music, do you know where the term came from? It's another well, reason I, know I like it because of the story. Scat, scat, scat. Well, I know, I know the great scat singers, um, but uh, scat, scat, scat. No, it was like, was it a syllable? Like scats, good do scats. Get. Almost, it's a great story. And here's where it originated from. Louis Armstrong was in the studio recording a vocal. He was recording a vocal, the air turned on or something, and it blew his lyrics off the music stand. The lyrics fell and he started, they scattered. So he just started, and that replaced the lyrics, and he called it scat because my lyrics scattered. And that's I didn't, where I didn't know that, but you know what? There's nothing worse than when it's done incredibly well, it's unbelievable. When it's yeah. done poorly, it's the worst thing in human history. It's, so, it's drunk. A bad, a bad <laughs> scat singer is just like, you know, when it's like really square and academic, yeah. and the kids are trying it in the high school jazz band. It's like, ah, give it a few <laughs> more years, kid. You know? That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Great stuff. That, those are great tips and really lessons for people. I love that you have all those PDFs available. Um, I, and I like also the fact of something that's helped me memorize very lengthy and complicated pieces of music, as well as even the simplest things, is learning by ear. And you, you could learn by the notation as well, but learning by ear every other instrument's part. When you can sing the bass part, the guitar parts, the keyboard parts, know every lyric, that's knowing every crack in the road and turn and curb and driveway and tree stump on the map of that song because yeah. you know what's coming. I've heard some drummers say, ah, I'm not a lyrics guy. I don't even really know the words to a lot Well, they of need to. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy, right? I really have heard that as well from that really – Prominent drummers, yeah. And if you're gonna be, um, if you're gonna be a song drummer like, uh, you know, like a Sean Pelton or a Kenny Aronoff or an Eddie Bears or some of the new cats that are coming, like let's look at like um, a Matt Chamberlain who always gets a great gig with a singer songwriter type. The guy can play so out and so bizarre, can play free jazz and then film score stuff with John Bryan, but then go and back up a. Uh, Brandy Carlisle and probably knows all what those songs are about because it's going to inform the tuning of your snare drum, the way you sonically alterate your yeah. alter your drums, the symbols you choose, the part you create. Um, Jim Keltner, you know he's listening to what that song is about. Yeah, absolutely. You know it yeah. for sure. Very important stuff. What are you going to do? Well, maybe the answer would be different now. Let me ask it this way. When you started <laughs> playing drums in 1976, did you ever imagine, even if you knew you were going to become a professional drummer, that you'd be working as a professional drummer into your 50s? Or did you have in your mind, I'm going to be a professional drummer, and then after that I'm going to do X, Y, Z? And if so, what, what would that X, Y, Z would have been? What did you see yourself as an old man of 45 
after yeah. your drumming career. Sure, you know, yeah. age is all a perception. What, what was For that sure. story in your head? Well, I think when I started in 76, it was, um, it was just, you know, my first teacher was like, you know, zhum, 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 brum, brum, you know, and then we got the Joel Rothman, kuti kidding ka, to kuti kidding ka. And, you know, listening to Kiss and Queen and going like, this is fun. I mean, I got, my teacher says I'm good at this. So maybe I'll keep doing this. But then, you know, I was really into Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back and banana bikes and climbing trees and riding my skateboards. And so I gave it more time till I was about <laughs> 11 or 12. And, and then, you know, the police came out with like, Synchronicity and Van Halen came out with 1984 and I was watching MTV and then that's when the fire really caught and I was like, that's what I'm going to do with my life. And ever since then, rolling up the sleeves, taking the lessons, going to college, investing in myself, I knew that I was going to do this professionally, no matter what, no matter how long it took. Uh, whether it killed me and I was just going to do it till the day I die. I mean, I'll probably die with the sticks in my hands, you know, one, two, three. you know, I mean, and that's cool. That's cool because I know that this is my calling. It's a gift from the heavens. And if I hadn't taken that gift and refined it and cultivated it, it would have um, been highly disrespectful, you know? So I, yeah. I, I think that I recognize that, that kind of gift from the universe and the effect it has on people when you play drums, when you step behind that instrument, people start to smile and then you land down a beat and then the band is smiling at you and then the dance floor fills up. You're like, this is my calling. This is my calling, you know? So yeah. I, I think I'm doing it. I think I'm and, and just drummers are young at heart and um, you could do two things. You can either play, be a drummer or grow up. And um, I think there's this child, <laughs> yeah, there's this childlike energy. Both. <laughs> yeah. And the poor women in our life have to deal with this inner child. Um, oh, my but gosh. It's, you know how many times a day I hear my wife say, what are you, 10? I'm glad she it. gives me that much credit. <laughs> God, I'm, glad, I'm glad you get 10. I get five. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, that's because you're still pooping in your pants, but that's another <laughs> <laughs> Hey, so knowing what people know of you, the way they perceive you as a drummer, as a musician, being familiar with Chase and Aldean's music and all of that, I, I love when drummers and other musicians, just like actors, can kind of break a stereotype, even if it's just a crack open door do you have any bands or genres or even guilty pleasures that you listen to that might surprise people because that's not what they know you for yeah oh yeah well i i've somehow have become and this is fine you know because the whole world is about people they you work your whole life and then somehow you get an opportunity and then that's what you become it, like this one trick pony, you know, and it's like, hey, hey it's great. To, it's better to be known for something than nothing. Right. Yeah. So people think that I'm the big, you know, the big beat drummer in um, in Nashville playing this music that we've cultivated over two decades. And I love that. But then at the same time, you know, in two weeks, I'm going to Texas and I'm going to do a all Latin um music percussion ensemble concert for my buddy Jimmy Olagi that teaches there at the really great high school in Odessa, Texas. And Lalo Davila is going to play timbales and oh, I'm wow. going to play. And then Fasto Cuevas is going to play congas from uh, Stevie Wonder's wow. band. So it's going to be this triple threat percussion section. And we're going to be doing, you know, all Mark Anthony and Santana and like all like stuff Spanish, you know, it's like it's yeah. going to be in Spanish. And a lot of it's going to be, um, you know, you know, um, transcribed for percussion instruments. So you go there and it's a double threat because you get to, to enjoy a new kind of music and you get to bring your experience and your essence and share it with the kids in this kind of communal music making environment. So I get to stretch a different muscle and they get to just, you know, grow and develop and this new skill set. And then the, we bring the, the music to the community. And then so everybody wins. It's just a great thing. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so like uh, all the time I spent playing reggae and Latin music and I know about two, three clave and stone clave versus rumba clave and I, and how to play a correct samba and then overdubbing percussion. Like a lot of people just don't know this stuff, you yeah. know, so when I get a chance to do it, you know, and, uh, you know, I was the rehearsal drummer for Chad Wackerman when the University of North Texas did our tribute to the music of Frank Zappa. So I'm playing like oh, Black wow. Page One and Two and Mo and Herb's Vacation and Strictly Genteel. So this is just That's fun. Great. So so people. um they go, he's that guy. But, um, you know, then you have to, which is great. And you get keep call, you get called for that kind of stuff. Another guilty pleasure for me is I'm a singer, songwriter. Um, I'm like a groupie. Like, I love the Lucinda Williamses and the Steve Earls and the Brandy Carlisles and the Chris Stapletons. Anything where it's like completely stripped down, 
no click track, bringing a story to life and just kind of like disappearing into the woodwork and blending with that storytelling. Um, at some point, you know, maybe later in life, I will connect with some sort of a, that kind of like a troubadour that, that goes and does those smaller rooms. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a thing. I just love that kind of stuff. That's you know? cool. That's awesome. You met, let's geek out on gear a little bit before we go. Yeah. You mentioned that you're getting a new black piano finish DW kit for the Jason Aldean tour. Tell yeah. us about the setup. The, what sizes? What are the shells? What heads do you like to use? I've seen you yeah. use, I think, a power stroke on some of the videos. Um, talk about yeah. getting your sound and what you use. So exciting to get a new drum set. It's like Christmas every couple yeah. of years with DW. But I've had the, um, you know, I just use the standard DW uh, technology from the, you know, the, eight, the late 70s. 80s, you know, just a standard maple shell. Um, I've used all the variations that John and Don and everybody are always trying to come up with. And I, you know, as an endorser, you're, you're, it's kind of your responsibility to do some field testing, provide feedback and that kind of stuff. But I just love the standard, you know, the shells that you created the company that put the company on the map that you can go buy a guitar center. And I'm very adamant about just playing drums that anybody can go up and buy a guitar center. It's no custom this, custom that. So, I've had the black sparkle finish. I've had a black and red sparkle finish. I've had a red sparkle finish. I've got the matte black finish that I've had for on the roads, like the Darth Vader model. And then I realized I hadn't done a piano black. So I was talking to all my friends there and they're like, yeah, go for a piano black. You know, it's so sexy. It's so classic. Um, and the sizes are 20 kick drum is 24 by 16. Nice. The tom are 13, 16, 18 with the standard depths, not the, my first DW kit was the Bobby Blotzer rat, you know, from the round and round yeah. video, the giant top. <laughs> and so then I, now I have the standard, standard sizes. And then, you know, I got the Ringo ride here. I'll do two hi-hats because I like the hi-hat over here. So I can kind of high stick. Mm -hmm. I can still get the hi-hat color, but then I can high stick for all the people out by the porta potties. And then I have two crashes, and I'm usually like Alex Van Halen, just two of the same, two 20s. Oh, okay. And then I'll um, maybe a 1920, or but usually just two 20s. And then I'll use that be brilliant uh, rides, um, China symbol, the uh, Chad Wackerman, the Chad, um, Chad Smith, Smith, Holy China. Yeah. It just, it's, it's a flash of brilliant, you know, like heat yeah, and then it goes with away. a snare crack. It's great. Bam. And then, you know, I've got the, you know, the some rolling pads and the SBDS act. Everybody's got to have that. I got a little double bass pedal and people were like, do you ever use that thing? I was like, well, it's there <laughs> in case I want to go the at the end of a song. You know, yeah. we, I think we have like one, maybe one trash can ending. You know, we're a pretty tight, meticulous band, like with very specific endings and, you know, um, transitions. So we don't yeah. have a lot of the guys we don't just don't we just don't do it like yeah. that but it's there if inspiration strikes um but yeah then the comp then the uh, the the head choices are on the uh, kick drum clear power stroke three with a flam slam uh because i've got my black sheep beater that i helped kind of design with dw and that's just like hickory just incredibly hard hickory boom yeah. um and then snare drum i've been using the p77s which are great to get that kind of low tuned back in black fat back you know not mud like rumors or Stan Lynch, yeah. you know, but uh, but like an ACDC crack that still sounds good in the PA system. And then on the toms, I've been using a clear or hazy emperors. So nice. God bless Remo. I've been with uh, DW about 12 years. I've been with Remo since 1994. I've been with Sabian since 2002. And I've been with Promark for quite a few years too. And I have my signature stick which is basically a black modified 5b that's got this active grip coating on it so as your body temperature rises the finish gets tacky and it allows you to hold on to the stick a little bit better so i nice. uh, love the gear and um all, all the companies i mean we need that support you know if you're traveling and you got to have a bat. You got to be a boy scout. You got to have at least two snare drums. You got to have a yeah. bunch of extra heads. You got to have your tools and your parts and extra crash symbols, you know, in case you're in Fargo and they don't have a music store and you, yeah. you got to have your supplies, you know? Yeah. How often do you change the heads on the road? So the kick drum is probably every few months, um, snare drum, every three shows. And then the Tom's, I think, every run or every other run. So the runs that we do in Nashville, since it's so central, is we'll leave on a Wednesday and we'll play Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So usually 
it's a new snare head and the new toms every three shows. Okay. Um, and don't forget about your bottom heads. Usually we'll change those once or twice during like a three month tour. So over a 90 day period, you know, cause those heads are on the bottom, the clear ambassadors, they're vibrating too, by just existing, you know, yeah. and they get worn out too. So be sure to change those every once in a while. Very cool. Great. Yeah. Now it is time for the rich Redmond fun fact series of questions. Here we go. Oh, nice. Strap nice. yourself in, put on a helmet. Ready? I, Ready, I'm getting the water. See? I think I know part of the first answer, but we're going to put it out there. Ready? Yeah. Favorite movie? Aliens. Oh, no. Ridley Scott. I, expected. I thought you were going to say a Star Wars movie. Oh, yeah. I know. Those are good, too. Yeah, we're a big Star Wars family. This is the way. I can. Um, <laughs> favorite television show, if you have one? Oh, God, for years it was Three's Company. First influence on the drums? Carmine Apathy. Nice. First, or not first, favorite meal. If you could have any meal, what is your favorite meal that you would look most forward to? Oh, like my mom's, my mom's ravioli with her homemade, you know, family sauce and the meatballs and the sausage and all that with the side of the little escarole salad, maybe a little glass of red wine. Oh, my God. Come Great. on. Favorite thing to hydrate with when you're working out or playing drums? Just regular old water but i love it cold they say that room temperature water is better for you but i i love that feeling of the, it's the cold water in the, the back you can feel throat. the temperature going into your body i'm the same way that's got to be cold love I, it. I have a refrigerator in my studio just for that reason it's got to be cold got to be cold great you've traveled all over the world where in the world other than my house and globe where in the world have you not been to that would be at the top of your bucket list Ooh. um um, I've been to Japan, but I played a bunch of outdoor festivals. I have not been to Tokyo proper. And oh, I know wow. that it's like, I want to go to the, yeah, the, the it's a, it's a, it's a crazy forward thinking city and it would be cool to, uh, yeah, do that go know? stay at the Rapongi hotel residence. It's both. It's an apartment has apartments and it's a hotel. Most amazing restaurant there. It's the best steak dinner I've ever had. Wow, it's incredible. Yeah, it'd be Rapongi's cool to do the Budokan, you know, it'd be cool yeah. to do the Budokan. You know, most of the venues that I, you know, I haven't done the Acropolis, but, you know, we've done, you know, Madison Square Garden, the Hollywood Bowl, and Red Rocks, and the Gorge, and Fenway, and Wrigley's, a lot of NFL stadiums. So, like, oh, my God, what's, uh, what's next? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, you'll find out. When you're <laughs> not doing anything related to music, not working – in motivation, not doing anything related to the things you do that you do, what do you like to do? Do you have a hobby that maybe we don't know about or nothing creepy though? It's a family show. I, I tell everybody, you know, the, the Fs, the food, the fashion, the film, the friends, you know, those are all great ways to, to, to relieve stress and, you know, re, whether it's retail therapy or going to see a, like a new film or discovering new music or being a Barstool philosopher with some like-minded people but my new thing coming out of the pandemic is is i reclaimed my suburban house here in nashville and i go out on my highly underused deck and for after owning the house for 12 years i bought patio furniture i've got a grill <laughs> i've got all the little lights strung up i go out and there's all these mature trees and i have my coffin i listen to the birds singing and i just think that there's this renewed sense of gratitude and humility coming in post pandemic and i look forward to the next 20 years you know so that's awesome at that that patio furniture, how many seats are there? I got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six seats. Not okay. bad. So you're in one of them. What musicians, past or present, are in the other five that you'd love to have lunch with? Oh, wouldn't it be cool to have like the um, the Mount Rushmore of drummers? So you would have Bonham, you'd have Charlie, you'd have Keith, um, and you'd have Ringo. And, and they're, you know, some of them are not with us, but I mean, it, it, this is hypothetic. Yeah. They're all, they're all alive, right? They're all alive. And we're all just like, I can pick their brain and, and, and they can tell stories. And then I will be the mixologist and I'll be like, here, Keith, here's your elephant tranquilizer here, John, here's some vodka here, Charlie, here's some, um, he seems like a, like a, like a wine guy. He'd have his pinky out or something, yes. you know, and I would just be serving up the whole thing. And you It'd know, what's neat about you mentioning them, 
they basically all come from the same influential background studying jazz. Yep, that starts studying the you know the 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 Zooty Singletons and the Mel yeah. Lewises and the uh, the um, you know those cats you know yeah. uh, Cozy Cole. Yeah. yeah, if you listen to Bonham's you know like Bucket of Fish type stuff, that's that's um, a Mel that's a Max Roach. Totally Max Roach. Dig it a boom. Dig it a boom. Yeah, it is Max freaking. It's a tattoo of his licks. Absolutely. And Carmine used it all over, like, say, like a classic track like Hot Legs, you know, yeah. for um, Rod Stewart. Yeah, which he wrote with Woo! Rod, actually. Yeah. Very cool. Rich, thank you so much for taking time to join us again here on Drum Talk TV. I'll send you the link to this uh, so that you can look at comments. I'm sure it'll get more comments even after it's archived, and we'll post it a few more times uh, throughout the next month. So check that out. Hang on with me after we sign off with the audience. And audience! Thank you so much for joining Rich Redmond and myself, Dan Schinder, here on Drum Talk TV. We appreciate you following what we do. Go to drumtalktv.com slash shop and get one of the three dozen designs of Drum Talk TV shirts. A hundred percent of the proceeds go to the American Diabetes Association, of which I am a board member of the Arizona New Mexico pod. We would really appreciate it. And then send in a video of you playing in a Drum Talk TV shirt. You move right to the front of the line. There you go. <laughs> <I> <laughs> All right, it, folks. Man. Thank you so much. We will see you again soon.